We'd like to welcome you to our current event and weekly Bible study for February 22nd, 2009. And we're going to continue from last week. Uh, one or two more parts here regarding the current updates on the 501c3 churches. Uh, this is kind of an ongoing issue that, that uh, it's just not like you can do one teaching on it and it, the issue then goes away. Uh, because of the progression of how the 501c3 churches are going to be used more and more and more in the New World Order agenda, it's necessary to do updates in order to keep you on top of that issue and in order to further validate and prove all of the other studies we've done on this in the past because this is just confirming all of the other groundwork foundational studies we've done in the past. This next article is from the World Daily Net. Um, this was of September 30th of last year, 2008, and it was entitled, uh, this is when Bush was still in office, uh, uh, Bush says the IRS should enforce pastor's ban on speech. Now, this is Bush, Mr. Supposedly Born-Again Christian, uh, which that's a joke, but he said the IRS should enforce the pastor's speech ban. And uh, this starts out by saying the Internal Revenue Service should be and is enforcing a law banning pastors from talking politics from their pulpits according to a spokesman for the White House. Now, when it says the Internal Revenue Service or the IRS should be and is enforcing a law banning pastors from talking politics in their pulpits, they're absolutely right. And I 100% agree with that statement. Because you cannot have your cake and eat it too. If the IRS created your 501c3 corporate institution or gave it the right to exist through the state, through the corporate structure, then they can tell you what to say and what not to say. Whether you want to admit that or not, they have that right. And that's the whole point of all of these studies, is showing you that, that, that it's hypocrisy for a church, a New Testament church, to take on this corporate status, say that Jesus Christ is our head, when... The state and the IRS created your corporate entity, institution, that you call a church. So if we go further, it says Deputy Press Secretary Tony Fratto told um, World Daily Net correspondent at the White House that he hasn't talked with the president about a campaign event uh, last Sunday at which ministers of the gospel addressed the moral issues at hand in the 2008 elections. Um, this correspondent asked, the AP, or the Associated Press, also reports that 33 pastors in 22 states made specific endorsements of political candidates in challenging the IRS Lyndon Johnson ruling about no political endorsement in churches. And we mentioned that last week. They shouldn't make political endorsements, in other words. It's one of the, the rules the IRS sets down um, in order to secure your 501c3 status. Uh, and then he goes on to say, my question is, does the president believe America's clergy should be not denied the freedom of speech to endorse political candidates? Frado responded, now Frado, again, is the de de deputy press secretary, he said, those rules are set forth, set forth in IRS regulations, directed by statute, and the IRS is enforcing the law. I, and again, I totally agree with what they're saying. 100%. This article is, is, you have to understand, the way this article is written, they're trying to say, no, no, this shouldn't be so. Sorry, you signed up for this. If you're a 501c3 institution, you signed up for this. This is what you, you freely entered into a contract. Now that contract is binding upon you, upon your church, upon the pastor, the deacons. So, you have to play by their rules. So, I, this article is written um, in, in defense of they should have this free speech. I, I don't think they should. Because they're, they're, under that, they're under their rule. Okay? So, then it goes on to saying the IRS is enforcing the law. The President, President Bush, believes that the IRS should enforce the law. But on specific questions of these clergymen, I haven't had that conversation with the president, the other clergyman they were referenced in the previous sentence. Uh, the campaign was launched by the Alliance Defense Fund, 
to ta- challenge the 1954 amendment to the IRS code that barred nonprofit groups such as churches from participating in or interviewing any political or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of any political candidate. So they're not supposed to be endorsing or uh, political candidates in these types of things if they have like a pro-life stance and these they're, they're really not technically not supposed to be doing that. Just because the IRS hasn't strictly enforced this for a long, long time doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing it. You know, it's like they've had their hand in the cookie jar doing something they shouldn't be doing. They entered into that contract with them, and now all of a sudden they're getting caught with their hand in that cookie jar doing something they shouldn't be doing, and now they're crying, oh, well, they, they don't have a right to do this. Yes, they do. At the time the effort was announced, ADF Senior Legal Counsel Eric Stanley said, pastors have a right to speak about biblical values from the pulpit without fear of punishment. No one should be able to use the government to intimidate pastors into giving up their constitutional rights. My response, yes, they should. If you, the 501c3 churches, willingly entered into a contract with the IRS and the U.S. government that gave your church its right to exist, that is your head. So you have to obey your head. You have to obey your master. You should be, at least. Either that or wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my children. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. So, uh, that's what they should be doing, coming out from among them being separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. Do you, do you, do you, can, can you imagine what this, what this is doing to churches on a spiritual level? Entering into this contract? Now, that's an unseen level. But, you know what? It's unseen, but I, but it's obvious and easy enough to see the fruit. Look at the state of the modern 501c3 lukewarm, typical, I'm not saying every single one, but the typical churches in America, uh, that are, that are under this, this bondage. Look at the fruit. Look at the lukewarmness. Look, look at, look at how they're not being salt and light. That they're not reproving the unfruitful works of darkness, and having a fellowship with them, that they're actually part of it, that they've given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're speaking lies and hypocrisy, and it's as though they've had their conscience seared with a hot iron. Things that should bother them don't bother them. Now, you can can say those verses about individual people, but corporately you can look at the the lukewarmness of this uh, position in America, and I'm sure in a lot of other countries, and see that it applies corporately to the church. It's a spirit, spirits. I mean, when you take this status and you yoke yourself up with the devil, well, there's going to be spirits that come in and influence your thinking pattern in these churches. That's why I can't in good conscience tell anyone to go to these churches. I get the, the most frequent question I get asked is, where can I go to church? You know, that's the one question I really can't answer. Pastor Sam Adams Church in, in uh, Bellevue, Florida. Pastor Ed Watson's in North Carolina. Dr. D.A. Waite up in New Jersey. I'm not saying those are the only ones. Okay. Um, and, you know, if, if uh, I really, what I'd like to do is have a, maybe some type of network for churches that are, you know, good churches. But I don't have that. And I'm only one person. I'm trying to do every single thing in this ministry with the Lord's help. Okay, I'm not going to take credit for any of it. But um, it's it's a... (laughs) Between YouTube now and and Sermon Audio, we're probably looking at, I don't know, 60, 70,000 downloads a month now. Uh, Yeah, 60 or 70,000 downloads a month, at least, most likely. That's not including the Google videos I have up on, um, or the videos I have up on YouTube. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm just saying the Lord's blessed this, but I'm only one person. There's a lot of things that would be nice, but um, I just don't have the time to pursue every single one of them because my time's so limited now. You can imagine the amount of emails that I'm getting that, that the ministry's generating. So this is much more than a full-time job at this point. And, and I praise the Lord. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. But... Um, uh, it would be nice to have a, some type of uh, network I could refer to. My biggest caution on that would be somebody coming in and wanting to infiltrate that, you know, some, uh, getting bad 
advice about a church that I've never been to, I've never seen, I have no relation to. So see, this is why I've been reluctant to um, recommend churches that I don't even know who the pastor is. You know, because then if I make that recommendation and it turns out to be, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing, then it's it's a bad recommendation on my part. I don't want to be a part of that. So, um, yes, it would be nice, and, and it's the most frequent question I get asked, and I feel bad because I, I, I just don't really know what to tell people if, if it's a... Um, yeah, uh, if it's a man that feels the conviction, you know, a lot of times he can start his own Bible study. This is how this little study got started. I've been in the Pentecostal church. I've been in independent fundamental King James only Baptist church. Uh, kind of run the gamut there and ended up here uh, because none of them were were um, really non 501 c three. New Testament churches, none of them were. Uh, some of them claimed to be, but they weren't. And um, that was the best thing I've ever done. It, it's like a freedom when you come out of that particular um, system that you'll feel. Uh, and so anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. So continuing with this article, it says, The government can't demand that a church give of its right to a tax-exempt status simply because the pastor exercises his First Amendment rights in the pulpit. Okay, so let me read that again. The government can't demand that a church give up its right to a tax-exempt status. Like, like, that's something they should be arguing for in the first place. You can't take away our tax-exempt status. Jesus said so. Remember that verse in the Bible where it said, you know, Thou shall have thy tax-exempt status. Thou shall yoke thyself up with thy government. Remember those? Well, you don't because they're not in there. <laughs> oh, boy. So this is the ADF, this Alliance Defense Fund, a legal counsel, Eric Stanley. He says the government can't demand that a church give up its tax-exempt status simply because the pastor exercises his First Amendment rights in the pulpit. you see how twisted this is? Do you see how wrong the premise of the argument is to begin with? They're arguing for a right so that they can be tax-exempt and that people can write it off on their IRS taxes. They can write off their tithes and offerings on there as a tax-deductible gift. That's a real great motivation to give to God. Yes. Of course, the Bible does say, let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You know, And if you, if you, if you give to be seen among all men, then verily you have your reward. But, um, you know, that's what, that's what they're saying. And then he goes on to say, groups like the American United, uh, Americans United International, internationally trigger IRS investigations that will silence churches through fear, intimidation, and disinformation. Hey, they created you. They have any right to come in there and do whatever they want. You're under their yoke. I mean, that's just a fact. The, then it goes on to say, the organization has posted a website video described the history of the rights of free speech, those who worked toward that goal, and how the restriction came about. Uh, going further, and this Alliance Defense Fund is continuing, and they're saying, prior to 1954, churches were free to evaluate the positions of political candidates on moral issues without fear of IRS revoking their tax-exempt status. Oh, boy. You know, prior to 1954. And then it said that year, then, S Senator Lyndon Johnson amended the tax code to add the threat of IRS action against churches if their pastors mentioned the positions of specific candidates from the pulpit. Citing that rule, groups like Americans United have repeatedly threaten to report churches to the IRS if they speak out on such issues. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit closer. So, prior to 1954, uh, you could actually talk against, or, or speak out against, uh, or inform people about political candidates. Then, Lyndon Johnson, um, Senator, amended the tax code, and basically so that... Um, you couldn't say you couldn't re cite a report on specific positions on candidates from the pulpit. Okay, so in other words, they're trying to silence the church. If you yoke yourself up with the devil, 
initially that yoke, he will make that yoke very light on you if he's trying to suck you in, most likely. The devil's good at what he does. He's not going to come in and, and throw, you know, 4,000 pounds of chains on you right away, unless he can get away with it. Well, he's going to make it look appealing. Come after your taxes, we're not going to really tell you what to do. Well, then, 1954, this happens. Now, in other words, the devil is always going to require more and more and more and more of you as time goes by. This is just further evidence of that. So since 1954, um, this has been this way. And then it goes on to say, citing the rule, groups like Americans United have repeatedly threatened to report churches to the IRS if they speak out on such issues. Now, guaranteed that the lesbians and the gays are all poised to do this as well. They're infiltrating the churches. They're coming in and taking notes. Oh, that pastor said this. Taking notes. Taking notes. Reporting back. Do you understand that, I mean, they could probably <laughs> take down most churches right now if they wanted to. And they have every right to. They have every right to. Going further, it says the intimidation of churches by leftist groups, including the IRS, has grown to a point that the ADF has no choice but to respond. You know how they should be responding? They should be responding like Pastor Greg Dixon and Barbara Cate and Pastor Slattery and myself and, and other people out there who are saying, and, and the, what really matters most is the word of God, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's how they should be responding. Not to be taking all these licensings and corporate statuses and all these things in order to say you're a church. I mean, do you think that that's a church in the Lord Jesus Christ's eyes? Something that has its head that, that's the government, created head? The ungodly government that's just getting more ungodly by the day? That's what they should be responding to. Get, get out of this system. In fact, they should be telling them, they have every right to say this to you. Because you entered into contract with them. Get out. Now, is it easy to get out? No. Would most people, would most pastors lose almost everything if they did? Well, from a physical standpoint, a lot of them would. They would probably lose their churches. They would probably be voted out. And they can't take that risk, evidently. They, they, but, you know, choose whom this day you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, I never got into any of this. So it was easy for me. I admit that. I mean, granted, yes, I was in some of these churches, but I was never... Um, yoked up into them, never like a, a deacon or a pastor or anything like that. I just simply call myself a watchman. So it was much easier for me because I'd never, I never entered into any of this. The, the Lord showed this to me um, pretty early on, that this, that this just seemed logical to me, that this was a much better way of doing things. Uh, if you're already entrenched into this system... The longer you're entrenched, the more demonic bondage you're creating on yourself. There's a spiritual thing that's happening here to these, to these people. And it's blinding them to the truth. Remember, the prince of the world has blinded their eyes that they cannot see. A lot of it's pride. They get in these churches, they build these big churches, and, oh, look at this church, you know, I'm running 500 or what. You hear preachers talk this way, oh, we're running 1,000. It's like cattle, you know. And, you know, we're, we're, and then they brag about their, your, their ties and things. I'm not saying they all do, but I've, I've been around that enough to know that that goes on. It's all about numbers and stuff, and, yeah, hey, everybody else is doing it, and my mentor did it, and this and that, and that for it makes it right. But the Bible says that the tradition of men has made the word of God of none effect. This is a very good example. That the tradition of men has made the word of God of none effect. Christ is not their head. The Bible talks about, you know, serving no other gods, having no other gods before me, you know, like the Ten Commandments. How's that possible to do if you're, if you're yoked up in this 501c3 status? Anyway, 
So if we go further, it's, um, let me just read this last sentence. The intimidation of churches by leftist groups using the IRS has grown to a point that the ADF has no choice to respond. So what you've got here are these leftist groups like the gays and the lesbians and this, this group they mentioned, Americans United. And they're going to the IRS, who is one of the most satanic organizations on the planet, and they're basically crying, oh, look at what they're doing. They're violating their, they know better than, than a lot of the, people going to the church, what they can and what they should and should not be saying. So then it says the number of threats being reported to the ADF is growing because of the aggressive campaign to unlawfully silence the church. My response, wait a second, it's not unlawful if the 501c3 churches are willingly violating their contract with the IRS. It's not unlawful. So, see, they're writing this from a certain standpoint, World Daily Net, that I totally disagree with. It's a good article to point out some things, but I totally disagree with the premise, the, 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 the premise on which they're, they're coming at this from. The, the IRS is more in the right than these corporate churches. They're more in the right. They have every right. In fact, it's almost as though they've been long-suffering toward these 501c3 corporate entities that they gave the right to exist to, they've been pretty long-suffering. This has been They've been violating these rules for, for decades, decades. Most churches have been. They've, been. they've been getting on, you know, political candidates and things of this nature. They've been saying a lot of things they shouldn't be saying. The IRS has been long-suffering toward them. If it creates you, they can create the rules. They create the rule book. Okay, so let's go further. This is an article entitled by Greg Dixon, Dr. Greg Dixon, who really paid the ultimate price because he got his church taken away from him, the largest independent fundamental Baptist church, and ultimately bulldozed to the ground. Now, I understand his son, they, they restarted the church in another part of town, in, 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 um, but the original church was bulldozed to the ground because of the stance he took regarding this issue. He even wrote a little booklet on it uh, entitled, They Tore the Old Lighthouse Down. And you can get that at um, unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com. Now, I don't really, he's the one that's taking the stance. I don't view this denominationally. I just view this as a right and wrong issue. Okay? So, if you want to know more about this, though, unregistered, unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com is a good place to get some good resources. Pastor Slattery. Um, very good place to, to um, uh, if you want to know more about this issue. Because I'm oversimplifying things because this isn't easy to get out of if you're in this. This is not easy. This isn't just something you make up your mind one day and the next day you're out of the system. <laughs> Once you're in the system, they don't want to let you go. The best way to do it is just to never get in the system, kind of like if you have a ministry, ever. Because once you're in, it's very hard. But it can be done. It can be done. But there's usually a heavy price to pay if that's where you've built your foundation. Uh, this one is 100 Pastors Considered to Find the IRS. 33 Do, Faith or Folly by Dr. Greg Dixon. Uh, the Associated Press made the startling announcement on May 9th of last year that the Alliance Defense Fund is actively recruiting pastors to challenge the so-called Johnson Law on, and again, this is relating to the last uh, thing we just read. The Johnson Law on September 28th, and they preach a sermon from the pulpit in which they will advocate the support of particular candidates in the fall election. Oh, wow, what a bold move. I mean, this is where the churches are now. That they're, this is, They call this, you know, define something. Now, granted, they shouldn't be doing this. Because they're under that yoke. They chose to be under that IRS corporate yoke. But the, aid, the Alliance Defense Fund is encouraging them to challenge the so-called Johnson Law and to preach a sermon from the pulpit in which they will advocate the support of a particular candidate in the fall election. Isn't the... I mean, this is wrong. Why are they doing that? They don't have any right to do that. Why is the ADF encouraging these churches and these preachers to go against their corporate charter 
and in in the the bylaws laid down through the Internal Revenue Service and the government. Why are they why are they doing that? Aren't they encouraging them to do evil? Going further, it says if the action triggers an IRS investigation, the Scottsdale, Arizona-based legal group will sue to overturn federal rules, which enacted in 1954. Under the IRS code, churches can distribute voter guides, run voter registration drives. Now, remember, this is under IRS code. Is, does that sound like a problem to you? The IRS is telling them what they can and cannot do. <laughs> Lest they lose their precious tax-exempt, 501c3, whatever status. So the IRS lets them hold forums on public policy and invite politicians to speak at their congregations. However, they cannot endorse a candidate, and their political activity cannot be biased for any, for, or against a candidate. So you're not supposed to be able to be biased against some pro-death, homosexual, loving and I mean loving the lifestyle, you're not supposed to be able to preach against some candidate like that. You're not supposed to say anything against Barack Obama. Technically, you're not. Uh, so, and then it says, neither can a church su support specific legislation. And you're telling me the churches in this country aren't gelded spiritually? Maybe that's a big reason why, why it's, everything's so lukewarm. And why, why the world's continuing to deteriorate so much. Well, the church isn't salt and light anymore. It stopped being that a long time ago. I think this had a lot to do with it. See, I don't just report on these issues because I think it's some little, so in order so I can hear myself talk, some little superfluous issue that really doesn't matter. This is that important. What this is spiritually done in the churches. Two things. I've said this before. When they introduced those modern-day mo modern Bible perversions in 1881 through Westcott and Hort, and they started to permeate into the churches, polluting the Word of God, people getting away from the King James thinking that they know better, God is not the author of confusion, and they had all these versions, now we've got hundreds of versions out there, and then there's the King James on the other side, I've done whole teachings on this. That started, the, when, you, when you, the Word of God is the foundation of our faith. I think we can all agree on that. Psalm 11, verse 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay, That started to, to, to leaven and permeate into the church. A lot of cults got started at that same time, around that same time frame. A lot of cults, a lot of splinter cults from different denominations were started. You have the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, same time frame, kind of. And then you have later... The government, via the IRS, coming in and saying, well, now you need to get your corporate status, Mr. Churchy. And if you do that, then you, you know, you're, you, you'll get subsidies and you'll have special benefits and privileges and your parishioners can write this off on their taxes. Now here's another layer of spiritual deception that comes in. And now we have, we look at the church today. Beyond, beyond, for the most part, pathetic, weak. Blind, just like the Bible says in Revelation 3 of the Laodicean church. If that's not the Laodicean church, I don't know what is. It's totally blind, yet they think they're in need of nothing. They glory in their shame, like they did in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. They're glorying in their shame. And then uh, Paul says in that, he says, Don't you know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? They've let this leaven, which is a type of sin, come in through their false Bible versions, through their, through their 501c3 corporate yoking up with the government status. The same government is, is going to end up yoking itself into the New World Order. It already is. You're on their team. If you're in that system, it's black and white. And it's that serious. Wherefore, come out from among her, and be ye not partakers of her plagues. So, I, I just believe it's that important. I believe these two issues are that important. And if you want to see the full verbiage of this, click on the PDF, 
with this teaching. Now, every teaching that I do, pretty much, almost everyone, has a PDF, a little white box below the green button that you press on the teaching page where it says listen and the little green button. Well, below that, a couple notches, is a little white box that says PDF. Um, a lot of times I'll get emails from people and they'll say, well, I want to know more about this, this subject, and the PDF is right there connected with the teaching. All you have to do is click on that, and it'll give you, like, for this one, I don't know, 35 pages of, of uh, confirmation, 30, I don't know. It's called Satan's Master Plan to Destroy the Church. For the King James, it's the same way. I have the verbiage right there. You can click on it. It's all there. The links, whatever you need, it's all there. So, it goes on to say, the Alliance Defense Fund said, the regulations amount to an unconstitutional limit on free speech and government intrusion into religion. It certainly does have a chilling effect, said Mike Johnson, senior counsel for the fund. Now, remember, I don't agree with the Alliance Defense Fund on this. I'm on the IRS's side regarding this issue. And I'll say that unequivocally, because they're the ones that created them. They make the rules. They signed up for it. Do I think the IRS is, is one of the most evil organizations that's ever been spawned? Yes, absolutely. doesn't mean I like them. But I agree with them because if you create something, you can set up the rule, the rules. So then it goes on to say, Johnson said about 100 pastors had expressed interest in participating, but only 33 did. So only 33 came forward and said, well, we're going to actually preach this. We're going to boldly preach this sermon endorsing a political candidate on September 28th. He revealed that the IRS has stepped up monitoring of nonprofit political activity during the 2008 election. They're monitoring. Remember, Big Brother. Big Brother. Cameras everywhere. Watching things. Intersections, roads. Narks everywhere. People narking each other out. Spying on one another. Big Brother. The D.A.R.E. program in schools. All it is is, you know, nark everybody out. You know, tell on them. If your parents, aren't, if your parents are, are saying this or that, turn them in. We'll take you away from your mean mommy and daddy. We'll put you with a good mommy and daddy. A good foster family. A lot of pedophiles love being pop, foster family. I'm not saying all of them. But it's an ideal, great, great place for them. They can get a fresh new batch of kids in. That's what the society is building to. A bunch of informants on one another. So that they can, they can make sure that those informants are, make sure that they're on Big Brother's side. Big Brother gives them a little pat on the head. You did a good job, but you better stay in line, or you may be next. That's where we're coming to. That's why the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But the fear of God is the beginning of understanding, the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. To this man will I look, the Bible says in Isaiah 66, to him that is of a contrite heart and a humble spirit and that trembleth at my word. That's fear of God. So if we go further... Uh, let's see here. Punishments can range from financial penalty to loss of tax-exempt status. Oh, anything but that. That's if you get punished from the IRS. The IRS investigations are confidential, and the agency does not discuss the cases. However, the United Church of Christ, where Sir Senator Barack Obama was a member, has said that under the IRS review, because of a speech given by the Democratic presidential candidate at the denomination's national meeting last year. Um, that, didn't, that wasn't worded right here. Oh, in, in other words, this church, this United Church of Christ, is under investigation because Senator Barack Obama, who was a member, uh, gave a speech there. So they're under review now by the IRS. I'm sure that nothing's going to come of that because of who it is. But uh, Then it goes on to say the New York Times has broken... The story that Bill Keller 
founder of LivePrayer.com with over 2.4 million subscribers to his daily devotional and host of Live Prayer TV program, is under investigation for possibly violating his tax-exempt status in speaking out last year against former Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Now, I don't know if you know, Mitt is actually his middle name. You know what his first name is? Oven. Oven Mitt Romney. Sorry. <laughs> little little humor. A little humor to lighten things up in this heavy subject. I always, I don't know, I think stuff like that. Just goofy stuff. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, he, was, he was against this Republican candidate for his Mormon beliefs. So... Taylor liked that one. So anyway, Keller, who was the um, first Christian leader to speak out nationally against Romney's belief, coined the phrase, a vote for Romney is a vote for Satan. Well, couldn't you say that about Obama, too? <laughs> I mean, I appreciate his stance. And um, he probably doesn't like oven mitts. And, and that might have been another reason that he spoke out boldly against it. No, just kidding. Sorry. A little clean humor there. Um... So, if we go further, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, an, ad, an advocacy group, advocacy group, sorry, I'm having a hard time with my verbiage here, in Washington monitors church political activity and consistently files complaints with the IRS. This is a group just designed to do this. And they have every right to, regardless of what you may think. If, if you're part of the system, you may think, well, this isn't right. Well, yes, it is right. They have every right to do it. They said Friday that they will notify the agency of any pastor who participates in the ADF campaign. They're good little Nazis. They're good little brown shirts. They're of their father, the devil, and of his works they will do. And they have every right to do it. The Lord is permitting this to happen so that the 501c3 corporate churches are ever increasingly exposed and pigeonholed and hemmed in. He's permitting Satan to do this so that they are put into a corner. So that they're going to finally get put into a position where they're going to have to choose whom this... And they've already choose whom they're going to serve. I, I hate to say it. Now, I understand I'm not saying every pastor that's 501c3 is some, you know, satanic and this and that. A, a lot of them are are truly unaware of this information. I understand that. But it's not going to change the fact that it's going they're going to be increasingly more and more put in a position where they're going to have to ultimately choose. Where it's going to finally become obvious to them. What have I done? The ramifications of these, you know, of their actions. Well it's not fair, because I took the church over, it was like this when I got here. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry, but you've had a long time to figure this out. The average preacher has. That's between them and the Lord. Does this mean I think I'm walking around in sinless perfection and I'm just perfect? No, I'm not saying that whatsoever. Okay, I, I've said this before. If I got what I deserved, I'd get death and hell apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm doing this because I... have Although I was never a pastor or a deacon in any of these situations, I've been in these churches before. It's so clear, so crystal clear what's going on, and I want to help them see. As the Bible says, you know, as you would do unto others, you know, as you would have them do unto you, do them unto others. The golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Okay? Very biblical. Well, if, if you were deceived about something and these types of things, wouldn't you want to help somebody get undeceived? Well, that's all less of what we're doing here. Sometimes you have to provoke people in order to do that. So, in 1934, an important change was made by establishing an additional qualification for tax-exempt status and contributions to nonprofit organizations. This change made quote, the deduction for contributions to an organization, a substantial part of whose activities is participation in partisan politics or in carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. So this is, these are things you shouldn't be doing, okay, according to uh, Internal Revenue Code um, uh, in 1934. You shouldn't be participating in partisan politics, 
carrying on propaganda, or otherwise attempting to influence them in legislation. In other words, you're not, you cannot be salt and light. You are spiritually gelded, and you better stay that way. And you better watch what you say, because we have informant, informants everywhere. And we're monitoring you. And we have every right to. And they do. So its proponents in Congress said that it would close loopholes that would raise another $258 million in revenue in otherwise avoided taxes. On April 2, 1934, Senator, Senator Harrison of Mississippi gave this additional condition. This was in 1934. The Senator said, quote, I may say to the Senate that the attention of the Senate committee was called to the fact that there are certain organizations which are receiving contributions in order to influence legislation and carry on propaganda. The committee thought there ought to be an amendment that would stop that. This started back then, 1934. In 1954, another significant change was implemented by Congress, which originated on the Senate floor, rather than from the Finance Committee. On July 2nd, then-Senator Lyndon B. Johnson offered an amendment to, uh, to um, the 501c3 section of the IRS code, uh, LBJ believed, Lyndon B. Johnson, when I say LBJ, LBJ believed a private tax-exempt foundation was indirectly contributing to the campaign of one of his political, compo political opponents. His amendment added the words, and which does not participate in or intervene in, including the publishing or distributing of statements, any political campaign on behalf of any candidate for public office. So, they're, in other words, the point here is they're trying to get it more and more and more restrictive. What these 501c3 churches can and cannot do. In 1987, the parenthetical phrase, uh, quote, or in opposition to, end of quote, was inserted after, on behalf of. The effect is clear. The new prohibition against campaigning is stricter than the old one against influencing legislation. The, la the latter prohibits any amount of influence in the political arena. So again, if you give the devil an inch, he's going to take a mile. That's the point here. He's been taking it more and more and more incrementally. The longer you stay yoked up with the devil, the harder it's going to get for you. And the heavier that yoke is going to be. But it'll be super light at the beginning and really heavy at the end. And ultimately, you know... I mean, if you, if you carry that logical conclusion if, if, if for an individual, the ultimate yoke of the devil is hell in the lake of fire. Okay, I'm not saying everybody that's in a 501c3 corporate church is going to lake of fire, but I'm just talking about yoking yourself up with the devil in general. So, going further, this is Dr. Dixon. Um, this is his whole article. It says, it grieves us that the Alliance Defense Fund is challenging the IRS on this issue. Now, this is exactly what I just said. I agree with, with Dr. Dixon in this wholeheartedly. Because it, he says it grieves us that this Alliance Defense Fund is challenging the IRS on this issue. Because we believe them to be on the wrong track biblically and constitutionally. Tax exemption in itself, is biblically and constitutionally wrong. To qualify for an exemption is a violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. To get the exemption, the church must first violate the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then must declare that it is under the authority of the IRS as a 501c3 tax-exempt organization, rather than non-taxable, as an organism of the Lord's church or body. You see the difference here? The Lord's church is non-taxable. A true New Testament Lord's church is non-taxable. He goes on to say the latter is protected by the First Amendment. A true New Testament Lord's church. Okay, That's what's protected by the First Amendment. The former which is the 501c3 corporate entity yoked up with the IRS and the government, is not. That's the reason it says Congress shall make no law, but Congress can make laws for legal entities, such as corporations, 
or associations that the state brings into existence. The ADF may win their case, but it will only be because the government believes it is, the, it is to their advantage in some way. Maybe to suck more people in before they really lower the boom. However, if they lose, it will mean that they have taken a giant step downward even further into slavery. They're in slavery. They're in bondage. They may not admit it. They may not see it. But all of these 501c3 corporate institution churches, false churches, really, 11 churches at bare minimum, they're all in bondage and in slavery. Well, no, they're not. I don't think I am. I don't see any chains on me. Well, they're spiritual. And, you know, that's just the way it is. It would be far better if these churches would abandon their lawsuit, take measures to get out of their state church status, and then stand on solid biblical and constitutional grounds. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Choose whom to stay, who you're going to serve. Many Americans find it disturbing that some of our churches today are little more than a milk -a toast corporations that fear our federal government more than the great I am. Aren't you saying when you take the status that I fear the government more than I fear God? I mean, if you really fear God, why would you ever take the status on in the first place? It's totally unbiblical, as we've amply proven. Moreover, it can be said that some preachers have the appearance of cringing politically correct cowards, uh, they have the appearance of cringing politically correct cowards, rather than committed godly men of fortitude with backbone, such as those that we read in the Bible. Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he, John the Baptist, said to them, O ye generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Was John the Baptist marking them which caused division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned in avoiding them? Yeah, he was. He was marking them. Jesus Christ did the same thing. Serpents and vipers said that. The reader should take note from the above IRS regulations concerning churches and other nonprofit organizations that there are strict limits on political activity and the endorsing of candidates for the very lucrative tax-exempt status and tax-deductible gift. There is no excuse at this late date for a preacher and church elders not to know the ground rules. There's no excuse. There's none. I don't care if you went to cemetery, I mean seminary, and got brainwashed, and you're doing it the way your daddy did it, the way your preacher did it. I, I, there's no excuse. I'm sorry. I didn't have any of that advantage. I grew up in a totally ungodly household. New age. You name it. I didn't get saved until I was 24. And God showed, showed this to me amply. Not, it wasn't the first thing I found out. I'm not better than them. I'm not saying I'm better than any of these preachers. Why can't they figure this out? They're spiritually been blinded. And a lot of the reason, not saying everybody, but a lot of it is because they're hirelings. And a hireling is somebody doing it for the money. That's, they're doing it for the hire. What, is, what does Jesus say about that? The true shepherd loves the sheep and will lay down his life for the sheep. If the Lord permits me to live, I'll live. But I could easily die for this information that I'm putting out. Easily. I could take a bullet for any of, of these sermons on any teachings on any given week. Now, I'm not saying to have to elevate myself. I'm being factual. In the day and times we're moving into, you're just going to have to get to a point where you're going to choose in this day you're going to serve. Are you going to fear man or are you going to, are you going to fear God? I'm not saying I'm the standard for that. I'm just saying that. That's, I'm preaching as much to myself as I am to anyone else out there. Okay, I'm not trying to elevate myself. Um, I say this as much to myself as I would say to anyone. So, these are just things that, you know... And it's going to get increasingly worse and worse and worse until they really, you know, it's going to be a, a real flagrant decision at some point. And as we talked about last week, where, where the 
many of these um, pastors are on FEMA's payroll, and that actually they're considered part of Homeland Security, and that the 501c3 corporate churches are going to be places where, where the, the pastors are going to be used to pacify the sheep, to quell dissent. Um, forced vaccinations are going to be implemented. They're going to be pickup centers, most likely for the death buses that take them to the concentration camp. It's going to get that bad. It was like that in Nazi Germany. Churches were used the same way. So, that's the sad state of affairs. This goes on to say the reader should take note um, from... Okay, we've already read that. The ADF lawsuit is simply saying that the participating churches want their cake, and they also want to eat it too. That's so wrong. They want the benefit of their master, the IRS and the U.S. government, but they don't want to abide by the contract that they agreed to. Absolutely. They want to take shelter in the First Amendment when the First Amendment does not protect legal entities, such as these 501c3 corporations, and even unincorporated associations, like religious societies, and corporation souls. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm a corporation soul, so I'm exempt from all this. No, you're not. Not according to the IRS code. I've read it. Unincorporated associations, a lot of these are, are not protected either. They're still playing in that on that same playing field together. So don't think that just makes everything perfect, because it doesn't. You need to really check into that. And then that gets into the more of the legal matters, which is where people like Barbara Cate and Pastor Slattery, I think, have a better grasp, much better grasp than myself on those, the legal ins and outs of all that. Now, if the ADF wins their case, They've got their way for now, but if they lose, the chains of slavery are going to be tighter than ever. For those preachers pastoring IRS-controlled 501c3 churches who keep saying that the IRS isn't telling them what to preach, read your marching orders right from your IRS Bible, and then look your congregation in the face next Sunday, and the Lord in your face at the judgment seat of Christ, and say that with a straight face. IRS Publication 8. 1828, page 7. I'm going to read it to you. Individual activity by religious leaders. This is from the IRS. This is the, the books that they should, this is the code they should be abiding by. Uh, for their organizations to remain tax exempt under IRS section 501c3, religious leaders cannot make partisan comments in official organization publications or at official church functions. Religious leaders cannot make partisan comments. Can't do it. You're not supposed to be saying anything against Barack Obama or anything for a pro-life candidate. Uh, then it goes on to say, to avoid potential attribution of their comments outside the church functions and publications, and this, this is from the IRS Code. I'm reading to you directly from the IRS Code. Religious leaders who speak or write in their individual capacity are encouraged to clearly indicate that their comments are personal and not intended to represent the views of the organization, which is the 501c3 corporate entity that they're under. Uh, then he, Dr. Dixon goes on to say, this has to be a modern day example of what Paul was talking about when he said, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away according to 2 Timothy 3.5, are not the churches of America in grave danger from the Lord Jesus Christ himself if they do not heed his warning to repent? Or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth, Revelation 2.15 and 16. Is he going to remove their candlestick? Did they ever even have a candlestick? I don't, I mean, I don't see how they could have even had one if they were into this thing to, to begin with. I really believe it's that serious. Look at the fruit. Look at the look at the modern day fruit of the modern day church. They're really being salt and light. Yeah, they haven't given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Oh no, they haven't spoken lies and hypocrisy. No, they haven't had their conscience seared with a hot iron. I mean, why doesn't any of this bother them? 
Could it be that their conscience has been seared with a hot iron? Why hasn't God chastened them collectively? Hmm, that's kind of scary. The Bible says, you know, if you're his kid, whom the Lord loveth, he also chasteneth. And, if, and I understand this is talking about an individual, but wouldn't it be talking about if the church itself, too, was out of line with God? Couldn't that biblically be applied in some way, shape, or form? I mean, I think that's pretty reasonable. Whom the Lord loveth, he also chasteneth. Like God giving you a spank and discipline. And if you be without chastisement, then you're bastards, which is an illegitimate son. So if you're not getting chastened, then you're a bastard. It's a sign and a mark of salvation. I mean, if you're living like the devil and you call yourself a born-again Christian, and there's no repercussion from God whatsoever, oh yeah, and you have no conscience of sin, how does the Holy Spirit live inside you then? <laughs> I just don't get that. You know? I just, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But they're glorying in their shame. These churches, they have no conviction of sin. There's no chastisement, at least yet. Now, the Bible does say judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. Well, we'll see. I'm not saying that everybody going to all these churches, they're all unsaved, they're all going to hell. I'm not saying that, okay. I'm just saying they're in a very dangerous position. Very dangerous, as far as I can see scripturally. So, for those preachers who say that they are only responsible to preach the gospel of salvation, they simply have no clue as to the biblical definition of the gospel. The gospel means good news, and the good news not only means sacrificial death, burial, and glorious resurrection of our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it also includes the whole body of truth as revealed in both the New and the Old Testaments. Remember, we can be destroyed for lack of knowledge. We're not supposed to be ignorant of Satan's devices, lest he get an advantage of us. 2 Corinthians 2.11 So we don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices. We want to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness, to make manifest them, to shed light on them. Salt and light, that's what we're doing. So we've got to be careful here. At different times in history, Satan has attacked the church at different points. In each case, the Holy Spirit, through God-called preachers, using the power of the Word of God, has repelled him. And at some times, the majority of Christendom has gone into error. Following is what Martin Luther had to say on the subject. Martin Luther said, I will, if, if I defend the whole Christian faith at every point, and don't defend it at the point where it is presently being attacked, then I am a coward and a traitor. Isn't this a huge, gigantic point where the Christian faith is being attacked. Haven't we amply proved that? Rather, I mean, and whose side are you on then? <laughs> if you're in this thing, and you're defending the 501c3 corporation, church, corporate church, you're defending that organization, whose side are you on? See, what I don't understand is there's a lot of really good preachers. You can hear some really good sermons. And they've been doing this a lot of years, a lot of years. What I don't understand is why they've never been shown this. If they're, if they're so hearing from God on every point, why haven't they got clued into this? And I see almost no preachers taking a stand on this. Well, if they're part of the problem, why would they say anything? It's, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's pretty uh, sobering when you look at it that way. So if we go further, rather than engaging in lawsuits to create bad law, like the ADL is trying to do, even in a case of a win or a loss, it would be far better for these churches to repent of their sin of spiritual whoredom by jumping into bed with the government for protection and provision through incorporation and tax exemption. Wow, I couldn't have put it better myself. Whoredom. Their, ad, their heavenly advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, would counsel them to go outside the camp with him, have his blessing and fellowship, and receive a crown of life, rather than to remain in Caesar's grip and lose it all when they appear before him. I hope that's the least of their punishment. I don't want to see them go to hell. The Bible talks about that some will be saved, yet so as by fire, according to uh, the judgment seat of Christ. 
I don't really know what that means. I don't think any of us know fully what it means. I really don't want to find out. But beyond that, the judgment seat of Christ, then you have a great white throne judgment for unbelievers. And then that one, you could just go get cast in the lake of fire. So, if you would like to have information on how to organize or reorganize a church to be biblically correct and to take advantage of your First Amendment guarantees, contact the Biblical Law Center at, um, it's just one word, Dr. Greg Dixon, D-R-G-R-E-G-D-I-X-O-N, at Earthlink, E-A-R-T-H-L-I-N-K dot net. And you can access this these um, newsletters that they, they have an email list that they can add you on to unregisteredbaptistfellowship.com and they'll send you the emails, the newsletters in a PDF format. Oh, I think every couple months. And you can get them from there. Um, this is a story, a little, of Pastor Florescu and his son, an extraordinary story of, pers of Christian persecution. The following story of Christi Christian persecution was submitted by Chaplain Tom Cole. Uh, it appeared in the Voice of the Martyrs. Pastor Florescu couldn't bear to watch his son being beaten by communist officers. He had already been beaten himself, and he had not slept for two weeks for fear of being attacked by the starving rats the communists had forced into his prison cell. The Romanian police wanted Florescu to give up the members of his underground church, so that they, too, could be captured. Oh, we're supposed to obey the law of the land, just turn them all over. No, we're not. I would rather serve God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be faithful to him than man. If, if the government's telling you to do something unbiblical, you don't do it. And you could say to yourself, but I can't, I, I can't do it. I, I can't, I, I'll crumble under... Per, under torture or whatever. Well, if that's your mindset, ask the Lord Jesus Christ to give you more faith because you have to have the faith to believe that he can, no matter how bad it gets, he can still give you whatever you need when that time comes. He's more than capable, but you have to have the faith to believe that. That's all. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that's how you build faith. Hearing the word of God. So, going further, seeing that the beatings and torture weren't working, the communists brought in Florescu's son, Alexander, only 14 years old, and began to beat the boy in front of his dad. While Florescu watched... Oh, man, this is, this is terrible. They hammered his body, his son's body, unmercifully telling the pastor that they would beat his son to death unless he told them the locations of the other believers. Whew, man, that is sad. Finally, half mad, meaning half crazy, Florescu screamed for them to stop. And then he said to his son, Alexander, I must say what they want. He called out to his son, I can't bear your beatings anymore. His bruised body, blood running from his nose and mouth, Alexander looked his father in the eye, and he said, Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Whoa. Then he said, his son said this, stand strong. If they kill me, I will die with the words of Jesus on my lips. The boy's courage enraged the communist guards, and they beat him to death as his father watched. Not only did he hold on to his faith, he helped his father do the same. Now, when I think of this, I think of the Bible verse that talks about of whom the world was not worthy, when it talks about all the, the champions of faith in Hebrews, and it says at the end, of whom the world was not worthy, persecutions, martyrdom, all these millions of people that have died, burned at the stake by the Catholic Church, tortured. This is one more example. Of whom the world was not worthy. 
I, I feel that way totally. I'm not worthy of them, of these two. I'm not. I don't feel like I'm worthy to latch, the latch on their shoe that the Bible talks about. I don't. I haven't suffered anything like that. Now, there may come a day where I do. But, I mean, do you think the 501c3 corporate churches would act this way? When they don't even have the backbone to come out from the world system? This was over an underground church. Remember, the Bible says, Narrow is the way which leadeth to life eternal. Few there be that find it. Broad is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go thereat. Isn't this corporate church the broad way? Do you think the people in the modern day lukewarm 501c3 Church of America would exemplify these types of actions if put in that position? When they've been yoked up with the world system, they haven't even had it bad, and they chose to be yoked up. These people have it bad, and they chose not to be. That's pretty sobering. That's, uh, that's sad stuff there. I mean, it's sad from the standpoint of what, can you imagine? Watching your child being beaten in front of you? Tortured? Well, it may come down to that. But, the Lord Jesus Christ is perfectly capable. Remember, you know, as soon as that boy died, he went to heaven. That was the door. The door. Life eternal. He endured to the end. They that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, oh, now we're saved by works? No, I didn't say that. Enduring to the end is evidence of the faith. The Bible talks about showing you their faith by your works, okay? But it's not works before faith. And I've got into this in several other teachings. Okay? It's just evidence. Going further, uh, this is the, the second article in this newsletter. President Bush seizes faith-based churches. Again, by Dr. Dixon. The old cliche, come shekels, come shackles. Get it? Come shekels, money. Come shackles, chains. This old cliche has never been more apparent than when board, uh, President George Bush gave the executive order 13397 on March 7, 2006, which literally turns the churches that have taken a faith-based funds over to the clutches of the Department of Homeland Security. Following is the order in its ent entirety with a brief comment at the end by Nancy Levitt, a renowned writer for the Constitutional Governance and American Culture. In a subse subsequent article, we will further analyze this order and its consequences. Looking at the amount of material I have left, I'm going to stop here and we're going to go to the next part, which will be the last and final part, and uh, we'll go from there. God bless you.